I get basically the global economy is undergoing a once in a generation shift. I think Keith is did a great job of talking about automation of human workflows and how that's going to change every single aspect of industry, business, education, healthcare, absolutely everything. Um, I wouldn't agree that we're going to stop working. If anything, we'll work harder uh, with our ability to do more as, as humans. But M&A is key for large corporations and enterprises to access startup innovation. But what I'm going to, so, so, so it's essential that they have uh, strong venture capital programs to juice their M&A programs. So, but I'm going to get into it more from the perspective of a VC and a founder. Um, I want to focus on M&A because 99% or a huge percentage of positive outcomes for a venture backed startup are going to be M&A and quite a few percentages of your, a big percentage of your negative outcomes where you're getting pennies back or you're getting stock in another company that looks like a loss, but can turn into a win over time. You know, I don't want to talk about SPACs, but I think the IPO market really shut down after the dot-com meltdown of 2001, where we had Sarbanes-Oxley and a government attempting to help the people, but ended up castrating the U.S. economy and therefore much of the global economy, while the Chinese have a very robust capital markets of dual tracking M&A IPO. Um, so, you know, you've got IPOs on the big boy exchanges like the NASDAQ, the NYSE, London Stock Exchange and local exchanges that are meaningful, say in Malaysia or wherever you are. You've also got the baby IPOs and a lot of Silicon Valley avoids this and the rest of the world does a good job of listing their company on an exchange like AIM in London, the TMX in Toronto, or, or I meant to put the ASX, I've got AIM twice, like the Australian Stock Exchange. We've listed some companies on these and we've made fantastic returns for us and the founders. Um, a lot of m and exits will end up as being some of your early exits where you invest in a company, the experiment is not going so great, but somebody wants to hire engineers and put a flag in the ground in Israel or in Austin or in Miami or Silicon Valley. And so Aqua hires where they acquire the company to hire the people or a team buy, you know, are pretty common. Sometimes there's the product buy, they're buying the product. And then other times that they're considering the customer base, they're considering the, the revenue. Share. Sorry? Oh, I apologize. It's an interpreter. I thought I'm speaking into a channel. Yuri, please switch That's on okay. the interpreter. I'll, I'll turn on. Uh, Andrew, try to speak a little bit slower because uh, you are uh, quite quick oh. in, in your English. Okay, 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 I'll do that. Yeah, I, I feel sorry for anyone attempting to translate what I'm saying here. So. I'll just back up to types of exits that you see are M&A exits are the most common. Um, SPACs are talked about a lot, but it's a backdoor way of doing an IPO or listing on the stock market. Listing on the stock market is just not a big percentage of venture capital exits. People can pretend that all their companies IPO, but it's rare. And after the dot-com crash of 2001, that economic downturn really changed the landscape on the ability of companies to IPO. And we had Sarbanes-Oxley made it uh, expensive to IPO. So the cost of an IPO was $6 million, annual compliance around 6 million. So we entered a point in history where companies stay private much longer. And we had the evolution of the secondary market where founders and early investors begin to sell some of their equity in the company before a definitive liquidity event of M&A or IP. Yeah. So exits actually really come in the form of IPOs big exchanges, small exchanges, and SPACs, these reverse merger into a publicly traded vehicle. And then beyond M&A, there's secondaries, which VCs have been slow to understand and integrate into their investment strategies. So if you are an early stage investor in a company that reaches that billion dollar market capitalization or pre-money valuation, that Keith was referring to, 
I think it's foolish to not sell maybe 5% or 10% of the shares you own in that company. But we could talk about strategies to enable your investors in your fund, your limited partners to take their exit and recycle it into an SPV to stay in that unicorn all the way to decacorn if they believe in the growth there. Um, but there is also, when looking at the M&A itself, um, so we're talking mergers and acquisitions now, you know, you typically have an all cash deal where the sellers sell their stock and get 100% cash. That's typically pretty good. Sometimes it's 100% stock for stock, and that's a whole different game that might turn out to be worth nothing. Or there might be earnouts that you sell your company to a buyer, and the buyer is saying, like in, in the case of Skype, they got something like 2.4 billion in cash, and then another two or four billion in an earnout. And if enough people download Skype and use Skype or something, or the revenue takes off, they get their entire earnout. Sometimes you can believe in your earnout, but when you get acquired, you have no control over the new company to push your Skype product or bury it. They might have bought it just to put you six feet under and bury your company, and you have no power to achieve the earnout. So cash in hand today is worth a lot more than you know, a bird in the bush or a bird on the roof. And so it's important to balance the exit consideration, whether it's cash, stock, or earnout. Um, you know, and there's a big deal of what is the valuation of the company that's buying you when they're stock. Often I find the valuation of the company that's buying you is a fantasy valuation. Um, it's not necessarily the real thing. Yuri asked me to talk about, you know, you know, total losses. You know, something when you hear someone say ABC and you're the investor, that's bad. That, that means administration for the benefit of creditors. And this is where it matters where you are in the liquidation stack. And liquidation stacks and, and, and uh, preferences are important. When, when a venture capitalist invests in the Silicon Valley, there's typically participating, there's liquidation preferences, participating preferred or non-participating preferred. And basically what they're talking about is that, let's say that you're the founder I put a million dollars in your company and I buy 20%. We don't want you to sell the company tomorrow for $500,000 and you get 80% of that $500,000 exit consideration. So a 1x, a one-time liquidation preference means that the investor gets their money back 1x. So if I put in $1 million, the first $1 million comes to me and then either I get my 20% of the remaining exit consideration, or I get the higher of either A, a million dollars one X back, or B, 20% of the total exit. So these things get negotiated and it'll impact the valuation. So if you want a two X or three X liquidation preference, that should increase the pre-money valuation and lower the percentage that you're buying into. So these are kind of, you know, levers you can pull and push or different cards you can put on the table, you know, for, for negotiating. You know, sometimes there is VCs make a lot of money by being good and having good karma and have a good reputation of not being a bad actor. And, and if you grew up in the Silicon Valley, like me, the entrepreneur has so much choice of who to work with um, that you better behave well. When investors are operating in a provincial market where it's an evolving ecosystem and there are not many VCs to choose from, you tend to see more nasty, bad behavior. For example, we've seen VCs in provincial, not Silicon Valley, not New York, not London locations invest in a company, maybe take two board seats. There, there's now two board seats for the founders, maybe one mutually agreed to. And so maybe the founders still have control of the board of directors. Then the VC puts in maybe 10 million or 30 million 
and takes another board seat, they now have control of the company. And I've heard stories of the founder and CEO showing up at the office and being told, pack up your desk, you're fired, we sold the company without telling you, and revenues were more than doubling, they would have no problem raising money from VCs, but that nasty provincial VC wanted to exit, return their fund, and raise the next fund. So they wanted to raise a fund you know, every two or three years, and if they return all the money, that makes it easier. I think that that's bad behavior. And in today's market, they could raise money at a much higher valuation and sell aggressively maybe 25% of their position in that company, maybe 5%, 10%, 10% in some of their portfolio companies that go up in value. And now they're in a position to um, return that fund, but not screw the portfolio companies. So it's a very nasty, complicated, bloody topic, you know, and I love it. Um, Yuri, you can still see my screen. Everything is working here on the Zoom. I just don't see your faces here. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. And then okay. my, my so let's switch. is as beautiful as, as it was before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's switch gears into M&A being fundamental to venture capital. So when you're the founder or the VC, when you're contemplating investing in a company, you should not think about, do I become a unicorn? Again, I think that's just the wrong metric. You should be looking at how much can I exit for? If I'm putting $100,000 or $1 million, whatever the number is, how much do I expect to make when I sell? And remember, M&A is, is the most common thing. If it goes IPO, if nothing, it's going to take a long time to get there. So you really have to bet on it being M&A. So you need a good understanding of what you expect it to look like. So being good at M&A is being good at being a VC. Never say I'm great VC and I don't know anything about the public markets or M&A. So for the buyer, this is all about, is it better to spend a dollar on acquisitive external growth and M&A buy a company and integrate it into my existing company? Or is it better to spend that same dollar on developing internal growth? Should I build? Should I buy? Should I partner? And there's a whole bunch of clashing personalities within the buyer, within the seller, around the VC. I often talk about making a five forces Michael Porter model about the company in the middle. What does the first angel want? What does the new VC want? What does the original incumbent VC want? What do the founders want? Did one of the founders leave the company? What does she want? So it's a total mix of conflicts of interest. And I would say M&A is about sometimes the external market. It's about fear. It's about offense. It's about defense. And I would say it's about animal instincts. Some companies are very big on M&A like Cisco. And some companies like Apple prefer to copy and steal than to buy. And that changes over time. So the original Steve Jobs culture is very different under Cook. So from, you know, it also impacts secondaries. So if you have a founder that's already divorced, hasn't done a secondary, has children that are growing up, they can't afford to buy a home. And then all of a sudden they raise $50 million and only 15 million is a primary to fund the working capital of the company and pay for things like payroll. And the rest of that money was a secondary where the founder takes five or 10 million cash in their pocket. When the founder does that and someone offers to buy the company for $500 million and they already took 10 or 15 million of cash. They bought a house for cash. The kids can learn to ski, private school. Now they might say, I wanna sell this company for a billion dollars and I wanna IPO or die trying. So the, the, the secondaries have a big impact on how everyone around that table with their conflicting interests think about it. So 
The other thing is it's fundamental M&A on how you would agree to the pre-money valuation uh, and the amount of company and the amount of cash the company needs. For example, we were involved with a company that was doing so well that we invested like a million dollars on a pre-money valuation of 10. And these guys were founders of Palantir, so it was a hot company. We introduced them to Ericsson. Ericsson became an investor and the biggest customer revenues were going great. They could have raised a hundred million dollars on a $500 million valuation, which would have meant that to sell the company, it really has to be sold for $1 billion to give the new investor a 2X return. And a 2X barely satisfies a growth investor. They really want 4X. So we decided to not optimize for dilution and take 100 million on a 500 million pre, pre-money valuation. Instead, we raised 10 million on a pre of 40. That is a post money of 50 million. And that means we could sell the company for 200 million, satisfy the new investors with a 4X return. And the number of buyers that can buy the company for 200 million is a big constellation of stars. Whereas the number of companies that could buy it for 1 billion was so small, it's maybe never going to happen. Very difficult to negotiate that exit. So typically as a rule of thumb, if you're investing early stage, you should expect in thinking about the M&A and all the dilution you're gonna get between today and how much money that company is gonna raise before the exit, you've got to believe in a 10X cash on cash return for your fund. If you're investing late stage, like series B, series C, series D, the company has a lot of revenue, a lot of customers, a lot of growth year on year, you're typically expecting only a 4X cash on cash return. And both of these are trying to get typically to a 3X fund-wide return. So if you have a $100 million fund and you return 300 million net of management fees, you get to continue to exist and raise a new fund. Now, our fund, just to beat my chest like Tarzan for a second, is making a 6X return, which I think will be a seven on fund one and a 12X minimum return on our fund two. So we're beating the 3X minimum that people expect. But let's, let's tear this apart and understand it a little better. Imagine you've got $100 million of dry powder to invest, and you're investing in early stage venture capital, and one third of your investments fail. So you get nothing back. That money is gone. One third, you invest that money, $33 million, and it returns 1X. Now, 1X is bad because you've got management fee already putting a 20 to 25% pressure on the performance of your investor's investment. But if you return it back 1X, you've now lost, you've lost a third, you got a third back. The other one third has to consistently return 10X to get your fund to this minimum 3X return. If you're investing later stage, you probably are not losing a third and only getting 1X. And so the 4X return on most of them will make up for that kind of 1X, 2X, I got some of my money back of the other ones. So that's a little bit about how people think. The other thing is that, you know, Ron Conway from SV Angel, the first time he showed me his portfolio, he had something like 250 companies in one, one vintage portfolio. So he increases the number of investments in one fund to diversify really, really well. If you put all your money on Fitbit in the stock market, that's very risky. If you invest in the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ top 100, you're so diversified, you're very safe. So the same thing in venture capital, early stage, big portfolio, 
at least 25 deals, if not 300, if you're investing in pre-revenue. And later stage private equity, EBITDA positive companies, you can be investing in a smaller portfolio. I see people with a portfolio of seven or 15 or 12. I like minimum 12, minimum 15. And as a lesson for VCs, every time you make an investment and you have dry powder waiting for the next ones, your, your little organism is evolving. So the little Frankenstein you are creating is becoming very risky or less risky. If it's becoming less risky, you can write bigger checks and concentrate in your winners. If it's not doing so well, you might consider some smaller checks and spread your bets to be a little bit you know, less risky. So, so another thing is founders and the VCs need to look at every unique investment and understand what are the M&A dynamics for this company. So for example, we've invested in Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest, we were in at like $30 million valuation when they had very little revenue. They had they doubled revenue 2019 to 2020 with to got to 250 million top line revenue, doubled revenue. So in a discounted cash flow looks good and profitable. So 250 million top line, strong profitability, 2x growth, and they're on track to do 500 million this year. So how did you, how did you identify that they, they will be growing that uh, fast? When you, when you invested or when you met them? So when we invest in enterprise software, we do not need to see so much revenue or so many customers. When we're investing in some kind of consumer product, we need to see that people are buying the product more frequently in a repetitive manner and that there's more of them. Essentially, we need to see that the dogs are eating the dog food outside of my, like Warren Buffett says, only invest in the things you use and you like. I disagree. Barbie dolls are a big market. And I, as a grown man, do not play with Barbie dolls. You'll be happy to know. But I respect that people are paying a lot of money for a little bit of plastic polymer and that that's a real business and a real market. Now, we don't invest in totally non-digital things like Barbie dolls, but with Daily Harvest, um, there was evidence that their unit economics to make their product was good. They flash freeze at the farm. So the amount of degradation of nutrition, by the time you get a strawberry at the market, even at a farmer's market, it's lost 80% of its nutrition, even if it looks perfect. These guys were being disruptive of capturing and freezing this. And they were convincing us that frozen is more healthy than not frozen. And they had, they, they, they demonstrated that, they demonstrated product market fit and they demonstrated a repeatable sales cycle. They demonstrated that they could spend money and get more money. They demonstrated that they can make these products and their roadmap of adding, it started with smoothies, then they added ice cream, soups, noodles, all these things that we said with our network, we believe in this and most important, the team, you know, with superhuman, that's very different. I knew his previous company, Raul, I had funded his cousin. So one of my existing portfolio companies became a good friend of mine and told Raul, you've got to get Andrew and his team in your absolute earliest round you can. And so he was oversubscribed because his last company was such a hit and he let us, I committed to invest when it was pre, before he founded the company and before he recruited his first employee. And I knew that Raul had the technical ability as a developer to make this product that he wanted to make because it was just the roadmap of Reportive. And he made Reportive. I knew that he could raise money even without our help, he could raise money. So I knew that he would not run out of money for years. And I knew that he could raise money and he had the charm and ability to recruit engineers. And he had the culture to allow the engineers to self-realize 
their maximum potential. And uh, so he had so many ingredients and I figured the worst thing that happens is we sell this company to LinkedIn the same way he sold uh, Reportive for $12 million or better. And we invested at an 8 million valuation. So I thought I can't lose. Superhuman is valued at a valuation of 825 million on a post this summer led by institutional um, investment partners, IVP. And they turned down Tiger Global, but let them put some money in. So we, we decided to use IVP to validate the, the valuation. Again, for Keith, we could have taken a valuation well north of a billion. And that company, I think I can say this, they started the year at 15 million ARR and they'll end the year at 30 million. Um, they could juice that if they wanted to. So extremely different on how we'll value a company and have conviction for the future, you know, on that. But, you know, if you look at Daily Harvest, you know, 500 million revenue, is it a 4X multiple? Is it a 3.5X multiple? Or is it a 10X multiple? You know, this is important. It's extremely different than the multiple of superhuman. Microsoft could justify buying superhuman for $2 billion and make a lot of money within a year, you know? So it's very, very different. So it's important to have people in your network that can guide you as a venture capitalist through making smart decisions on understanding the valuation now. Is the company capital intensive? Are they gonna raise so much money after me that the denominator gets bigger and my numerator, my cash in, remain static. So if I own 20% today, will I own 10% at exit or 5% at exit? So if it goes from 10 million to 100 million, do I make a 10X because they never raised more money? Or am I making a 3X because of the amount of money they make? And I invested in something very, very risky and I'm getting less than the late stage return. So I'm a bad venture capitalist if I'm doing that. So one thing we have at 7BC Venture Capital is we have, we, we're, we're secretive about this, but people that are on the corporate development team at large tech titans, and just think of the five biggest companies on the NASDAQ that are all West Coast tech, people that are in the M&A team have personal money in our venture capital fund. And we can say to them, would you guys buy this? If you, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Flickr and Picasa. So when the internet was evolving, we had Yahoo and Google. And ya a lot of people were loyal to doing search on Yahoo. Yeah. But Google had more traffic. And Yahoo bought Flickr as photo sharing. And then quickly, Google bought um, Picasa for photo sharing. And so if you had a photo sharing company now, who is going to buy you? It's like musical chairs. The music stopped. Yahoo, Google made their bet. The other question is, Google could pay 10 times the price to buy the same company and have it be an accretive, you know, profitable investment compared to Yahoo, who had less traffic. You know, I think um, I'll give one more example, which I think is fascinating. And you need to be on the inside track of things to get this. Instagram launched with their version of photo sharing decades after Picasso. And Twitter decided we want to buy Instagram. If Twitter had bought Instagram, you know, after going to a barbecue with Yuri or an event, the next morning, my wife wakes up looking at photos on her phone on Facebook. She might stop looking at Facebook and start looking at photos from the barbecue of the weekend on Twitter. At the time, Facebook had just IPO'd, had a $100 billion market capitalization. They bought Instagram with no revenue for $1 billion to protect the $100 billion of market cap and stop my wife from going from Facebook to Twitter to look at the photos from the weekend. So Twitter wanted to buy Instagram. VCs were courting the company and loved the company and understood the M&A environment. And Facebook was ready to buy it 
just to bury it six feet underground. And it turned out that Facebook was the Google of the day that they could increase the CAC, the cost of acquiring customer or users for Instagram at zero cost and turn it into a multi-billion dollar company that New York can understand with a discounted cash flow of top line, bottom line, and growth. So you know, the other thing is you don't always get to sell your company to Facebook at a peak with this perfect storm of lots of investors for every stage, lots of buyers fighting it out, and a company with a great vision. Sometimes you get acquired by private equity. Sometimes you, know, you get acquired by a buyer when the company is running out of money and their little Bunsen burner science experiment is proving to not work. Sometimes you invest in a company with conviction and it's just not working. They're not getting revenue. They're not growing. They're not demonstrating metrics to go through the next gate and get the next venture capital funding round. And so you can keep funding the company and it's going nowhere. It's a bridge to nowhere. So it needs to be sold. In these instances, it often gets sold to private equity or some buyer. And at that point, the buyer wants to give the smallest amount of money to the venture capitalists and the most amount of incentive to the manager, the management they want to keep. So this is where it depends. Is this a product buy and they want to fire all the engineers and fire the CEOs? Is it a team buy? Is it, is it early enough that they need to motivate the team? Maybe you invested in an IoT company and Hitachi wants to build up its, its IoT business unit. So they're going to give as much as they can to the founder and as little to you as an investor as they can get. I invested in a company where we, we only got stock in another company. Later, Amazon bought that company and we ended up making like a 5x return. But we were down if we had sold our stock in the first company, which was private. Later, the founder made so much money that even though it looked like we were losing, he's investing in my fund. And we you know, keep that relationship together. So it's important for the VC to be thinking about M&A every time they're thinking, am I getting a 10x? Am I getting a 4x? Do I need a 100x to make my portfolio construction work. Every VC should make a spreadsheet and say, how much money do I have after the management fee? And what percentage of the fund do I want to invest at this stage, this stage, this stage? What's the average check size? So maybe take you know 10% of the fund and leave it for late stage, maybe 30% for pre-series A. Maybe the rest of it is series A and B. And then see how much money you have, divide it by the amount of diversification you need, and you'll get to understand what I need to do. And so if you're making an early stage investment, and it's a crazy valuation, you know, maybe you should move on. So I'm pretty much done there and ready to go to questions. I can share the slides. If people want to invest in our fund with a tiny check, they can do that on AngelList. We're using crowdfunding 506C. So it's legal for me to talk about it. For larger investors, they come directly into our fund and talk to us. We also have a syndicate on Angelus, which we're just starting to allow people to not invest in our fund and invest with us with small checks or big checks on a deal by deal basis. So I'm not gonna turn this into a commercial. I've created links to download the chapter on M&A from my first book. You can see my first book has been published by Alpina in Russian. And my second book, Masters of Corporate Venture Capital, CVC, you know, Alpina has been working on that. It should be coming out soon in Russian language, you know, as well. If anyone emails me, I'll just email you the link so you don't have to worry about this crazy domain here. And my email is and, and, Andrew. And, and Andrew, you can uh, share you can share the sli uh, the slides in uh, uh, with me or uh, or share it in in the Telegram group, and uh, participants can just uh, use the, the these links. You know? Perfect. Yeah. So so um, so that's it. So I've got um, 
I put a, I put a, uh, whatchamacallit, link for the streaming. So I've already uploaded the slides to DocSend so people can stream them. Sounds good. So let's uh, go to the questions. How much time do you have uh, for Q&A? Um, I, I, I have time. I have time. I'm flexible. I have. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's do Q&A. Um, guys, please feel free to ask uh, any questions, but turn on your video when you ask. Yes, uh, if you don't mind, this Allah. Thank you, thank you for valuable information. And, Just and I would please, like to please say uh, kind of where you're from and a little bit about you. Yes, this Allah. I'm from uh, originally from Syria. I'm based in Dubai for more than ten years, and uh, I'm looking after some investors here in Dubai. And thank you, thank you for the, the valuable information that you shared with uh, with us. Actually, the the question. If let's assume we are the VC and we have a startup fintech startup and we i'm doing the valuation of this startup should i consider the round a round b round c round d to to prepare the m a for example if the irr in the round a is 30 percent round b 40 percent round c 50 percent or round d 60 percent because if i want to to increase if the, the irr is is more than 50 percent how i can prepare the m a to be realistic, the, the, the exit amount to be realistic. So have, have you faced this issue before? Yeah, so in, in a highly evolved ecosystem like Silicon Valley, New York, London, you have lots of different investors at every stage. So there's many investors that only invest in pre-revenue companies. There's other investors that only invest when the company has 1 million of revenue annually and so on and so on. And there's companies that only do secondaries. They want to buy shares in Superhuman before you know, it sells or IPOs. In a less evolved ecosystem, like if you're the only VC in Lisbon, Portugal, you may need to reserve money to de-risk the company failing and to enable the company to self-actualize more of a full potential. You know, But every VC will have a, its own strategy. They may not be totally unique, but somebody might have a strategy to be multi-stage and invest from seed studio, like they're creating the company, all the way up to the final exit. Um, and that's what they're doing. For our fund, we, we operate, we tend to invest in companies that are domiciled in ecosystems where we know investors for every stage. So we do not need to use our cash to take the company all the way. And in fact, we've made a strategy that very much works as part of the entire system all, of all the other investors. So we tend to invest in about 25 companies that are pre-Series A. Five of them will be like Raul from Superhuman walks into my office, I commit. But that's only five. And only 30% of our fund was pre-A. The other 20 typically have at least $100,000 of monthly reoccurring revenue if it's enterprise. If it's consumer, it'll maybe be a lot more. It might be a few million. And, um, and then that'll be about 30% of our money. And we're diversified enough that we neutralize the singular risk of one investment. 70% were investing mostly in Series A and Series B rounds, which is a little bit for growth. And, and we think that's the optimal risk reward inflection point to get the entire fund to not a 3x, but like a 12, 15, 20x cash on cash return and very strong IRR. But I hate watching my companies raise these later rounds and give it all to some big VC. So that's why we're doing SPVs, special purpose vehicles, and even putting something on AngelList to get beyond our network to say, hey, Superhuman's raising money at a 750 million pre. I'm really good friends with the founder. And I have a legal pro rata equity right to maintain my ownership percentage. If it's only going to make a 5x that will have a negative impact on my fund performance. It'll hurt a 12X fund. But for you or one of your family offices, 
if I can put you into that round and convince you that you're going to make a 2x return, I cannot imagine superhuman selling for less than $750 million. You're really looking at a 2 billion, 5 billion, or 10 billion exit. It depends how long it would take. And we can get into the details of each one of those things. So for us, we're, we're tightening the fund around A and B, but we're very active with 30% of our money going in before to not with be medium, so arrogant. With medium risk, when round, round A and round B, is read, and medium and the nor, let's, let's say normal, it's not high, like the, the, the early stage and not any uh, low risk in the, in the uh, like round C and round D, right? Or I'm wrong. Well, so, so the market is going to dictate how much money they're raising and what the valuation is. So 2021 has been a crazy, crazy year for large rounds at big valuations when companies did not even need the money. So that's the market having a huge impact. So you can sit alone on your laptop with an Excel spreadsheet with your fantasy ownership. But if you wanna do these real companies, that's assuming you have the deal flow and assuming you can talk your way in. Like to use a crude metaphor, you could be invited to the, to the, the party in the Hollywood Hills where all the beautiful women are at, that's deal flow. But if George Clooney, Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio are also at the same party, what are you saying? to get that woman to leave with you. You need some game. You need to say, why am I a good enough venture capitalist that I get a slice of this deal? And the valuation is big. Right now, if you're in a B, C, D round, they're probably not selling a huge percentage of the company and your ownership target percentage is gonna be difficult to achieve. You need a very strong brand to achieve a big percentage if you're coming in late, in my opinion. So, you know, it depends. You know, I think the best thing I could say is think in terms of big portfolio with many companies and a 10x plus valuation. And you're hoping for some 100x, 150x, 50x, 30x is in there. But if you cannot imagine how you're going to make a 10x and it's early, stay away. There's a lot of good blockchain deals, but they're raising 50 million on a pre of 150. That's got to get to 1.5 billion with no more funding between now and the exit and its early stage. And that's to make a silly little 10X. I say no to that nonsense. If I'm investing early, I want to see minimum 10X with more funding and dilution, including my own funding, and I'm hoping that there should be a chance of a 50x return or better. Thank you. Thank you, please. Guys, go ahead. Who, who is up? Who is next? Oxana. I think I saw someone. How do you predict a multiple? In fact, you know, Yuri, why don't why don't I not pay attention to the stream? Of yeah. chat and you direct you be the, the question guy we we have oksana oksana please uh, ask the question and yeah uh thank you it, it sounds really magical that uh someone can predict a multiple can you please elaborate on that like what gives you uh like what what kind of background should an investor have to be able to predict or at least you know expect a multiple yeah. specific multiples so it's not about your brain and personal life story in isolation to predict a multiple it's about your brain and personality and history to network into the global computer of all the brains so it's important to have a network of people to reach out to to speak with that you can trust that like you to give you honest feedback of what they think a multiple is and make a convincing argument of why you should agree with them in any way. And then get multiple data points to triangulate on a multiple that you can get behind. For example, we're investors in, you know, well, I mean, I mean, bottom line, some, some companies 
if you're a services company that's dishwater boring and just doing something that everyone else does, you might be looking at a below 1x multiple. You know, I have a friend who's got an uh, accounting company and he's rolling up, he's rolling up um, other accounting companies and he wants to pay for VIP dinners for us to have events all over the world. I'm like, sure, you can pay $20,000. I'll take 15 friends to a, a nice restaurant and let them talk about accounting. He buys companies for like 0.8 to like one point something X top line revenue and brings them in and makes his bigger monster. As a venture capitalist, we would never invest in that kind of business, right? You know, you tend to look at, you can look at, you know, one proxy, you can do comps, right? And then you can use dis discounted cash flow, and then and then think of the comps for that. Like we're investing into Easy Knock right now at a two hundred and fifty million pre money valuation. My first investment was a forty five million. My second investment was ninety. My third investment's going in at two fifty. I believe very firmly that with their revenue and their expected revenue, that they will achieve a NASDAQ IPO listing after all my lecture of forget IPOs of minimum $2 billion. And so I think that the 250 million is pretty amazing considering the stage the business is at. It's so far along, you know? And, you know, if you look at Super Coffee went to raise 50 million and then they got a term sheet for 70 million and it was so popular, it closed at 106 million over the summer. They considered to have like a 3.5 to 10X multiple. And we know this with pretty much certainty, having spoken to so many investment bankers over the years. And we continue to talk to all of them before deciding how much money to raise, what valuation, to, to give people like that 4X, you know, multiple. So sometimes it's about do the work. It's definitely not about, well, I was born as a farmer. And so I can only invest in the stuff that I grew up doing. And, you know, Keith can only invest in, you know, you know, Newcastle coal mining because of his grandpa and his father worked in coal. The guy's gone out and learned all kinds of stuff regardless of his background. And he's a super networker, so he can get educated on multiples for something very, very quickly, you know? And should you, should you provide yourself with board seats to, you know, have a hand on what company is doing to at least have some kind of, uh, you know, power over them? Yeah, so, you know, power over them is, you know, maybe that's a cultural way of expressing it. I, I like to talk about as governance, like how to govern the country, how to govern the company. So within, within governance, um, there, this is a topic I'm quite passionate about because I think that you saw the emergence of the convertible note was first written by corporate securities attorneys to provide for a bridge financing where the company needs money just to get to a transaction of either a big financing or an M&A outcome or an IPO or something. And, or waiting for this big Walmart customer to kick in so that it'll be easy to raise money. And then the documents became abused. Accelerators like Y Combinator made it even more founder friendly and worse for the investor. And they have safes and the post safe and they are stripping out all governance. The governance part of the term sheet is, you know, to hell with all the investors. They're all worthless roadkill you know, uh, they don't add value. Getting an investor from the middle of, you know, Siberia is the same as a guy who's got LPs that are on the M&A team at Google, Facebook, and Cisco, and VMware. I mean, you know, we're not the same, you know? And so building, I think the most important decision a founder will ever make is their first employee or co-founders. That's the most important decision they'll ever make. Every time you in, bring in an investor on the early stage, that is a, a vital like junior co-founder who can tell me what a multiple is. 
who can help me raise 10 on 40 so I can sell for 200 and not follow this other idiot, idiot into raising 100 on 500 and we come up with nothing and we can't raise more money and no one's going to buy us and we're a loss making, not profitable, bad, you know, you know, bad company to be left holding the bag on, you know? So on governance, I think that companies should have a board of directors from day one, but you need director and officer insurance. And when the company is raising such small amounts of money, it's a bad idea to spend that on DNO, director and officer insurance, where I'm afraid to join the board and someone tries to take my house away. You know, So um, you can have a board of advisors and insulate the directors from that personal liability risk. And then typically when you have a series A financing is where you see governance in the term sheet and the professionals are there. These people doing uh, safe notes and convertible notes where it didn't even occur to them to ask a question about the board and governance. It shows you the children amateurs that are having an impact to the business and it's not good. When, when the professionals come with a series A, you're gonna see typically five people on the board, two for the founders, two for the money and one mutually agreed to board member we always try to draw on our LP base and get someone who's an LP in our fund who fits culturally, who has experience, who's got complementing something to join the board as the mutually exclusive guy. He's not the money, he's not the founder, and he's got, she's got the gray hair, she sold, she ran Nestle, you know, something relevant. And then, and then that person's a little bit loyal to me. And, and gives me a little power, as you were saying, I don't like to use the word publicly, but like, you, you know, that, 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 that is a, tr you're, you're really speaking the truth. I'm being diplomatic about it. So that's a typical structure, you know? And, and, and I told the story earlier, if people were listening, if I wasn't speaking too quickly about the VC, who's a predator in the provincial lo you know, location where the VC, the founder did not have a lot of choice. The existing investors were unsophisticated. They didn't do their research and they gave up two board seats, then three board seats, and the company got sold when that was stupid. They should have given that guy a secondary so he can raise his next fund and then let the company become a multi-billion dollar you know, company. So governance is a huge thing. It's being very badly screwed up in the Silicon Valley and everywhere, and people should pay attention. Um, Andrew? Thanks for, and it's very delightful to, to have you and uh, share your, your views. Uh, could you expand more about the secondaries? What do you mean and how, what's their role? Because you mentioned that. And yeah. since then I've been thinking about it. So a secondary for everyone to be on the same page is when someone is selling equity in the company before the definitive liquidity event of an M&A or IPO, you know, SPAC kind of, kind of exit exit um, event for the company. So it used to be that most VCs and founders had this flawed belief that if Bill Gates is selling his shares, some of his shares in Microsoft before the IPO, we, he knows more than we do and it must be bad. And that's a signal that we mm -hmm. should all sell our shares in Microsoft, creating a run on the bank and turn the company to dust and ruin it. That's that was the, the that's what uh, Adam from WeWork was doing, right? Bef before the IPO. Okay, so this this old view that I gave with Microsoft, Microsoft has evolved. And my first book was written so long ago that chapter 10 was me making the case for why in many cases, a secondary is a good thing and should be encouraged or at least tolerated. And that now it's become the norm. And like I illustrated an example before of a secondary having a potentially negative impact or changing the dynamic around an M&A decision, at least what the founder wants. And that's where you make the companies in the middle, put this on a whiteboard or a piece of paper, like a Michael Porter five forces model and say, who are the big shareholders who have a vote on the board or voting rights with their equity? And if the founder goes from no secondary and is renting an apartment in uh, 
New York or London or San Francisco and really needs money, if they do a secondary, maybe they can calm down, keep the wife or husband happy and go with the VC for unicorn stuff. But sometimes they sell so much that they de-risk okay. themselves and don't even care. And, and I, think, I think the time when we should be most concerned about founders or even early investors taking big early liquidity is when the company is still not through the woods. Like we don't know for sure this is really going to work. I mean, there's no such thing as a lock-in zero risk. Just raising a lot of money presents all new risk with the liquidation stack of who gets money out now. But in general, every situation is unique and every situation should be looked at individually. Another problem is the large funds. Like Lightspeed used to be a $100 million fund, then a $250 million fund. Now it's in the billions of dollars. Lightspeed invested $47 million into Daily Harvest. Only $15 million was a primary. That changed everything, you know, for the round. Mm. I think for an investor, for us, we want, if you go back to the idea of what's better for your LP investor, if you have outside investors, making a 12x cash on cash return, but it can take 10 or 12 years, or making a 3x cash on cash return three times within 10 years or 12 years. That what we're doing is we invest at, when they have 100K of revenue, it's like 1.2 million annual. We fund it, we bring in a lot of friends. They were growing without us. They'll go fast from 100 a month to 500K a month. Then we, as a small VC, introduce them to everyone we know that we like, that we think add value, who can help us figure out the multiple, whatever they bring. And then on the net, we, we write a check for a couple million now, much bigger check. And on the next round, we make a lot of introductions. We are gonna start selling 5% to 25% of what the fund owns in that company. But we say to every LP, let's say that you are an LP in the fund, and I say, hey, I'm returning $350,000 to you and you put 1 million in the fund. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with two others. So you get your full million back within 12 to 24 months of you putting the money in the fund. So that's good for you, but I'll say, I wouldn't sell Super Coffee now. It's gonna sell for a billion dollars and we're selling at 430 million. I think it's gonna sell next year. It might wait a year and a half so it sells for 1 billion. So this is all of our insider trading information with our information mm -hmm. rights. We have legal information rights and a relationship and all this data. I can have that conversation with you and say, and you can say, okay, the fund is selling 10%. Your cut is 350K. That's like a third of your LP investment. That's awesome. And you know, I'm gonna do that two more times and get all your money back. But I say, do you want to recycle that into the SPV and stay in for that two or three X from here? And so you get to choose as the LP to recycle or take the cash. So we're kind of have our cake and eat it too. So the fund is going to sacrifice a little bit of cash on cash multiple, or mm -hmm. maybe we had conviction that it's going to go out for a billion and there's a tornado earthquake and it went to zero. And the best thing we did was to take a 50 X and sell 10%, you know, and gets the whole fund to zero. And we were lucky that we went into 2008 volcano Lehman brothers already like a three X fund, you know, who cares, you know? So, so that's what we're doing with secondaries. The fund itself is selling a little bit, but we sell to ourselves first. And if our own guys don't take 100% of the fund, we could put it on angel list or show it to some secondary funds we know that do that, you know? And our expectation is that our small LPs will take the cash and I'm happy so they can re-up in our next fund, not waiting for 10 years, right? Because they're regular people, accredited okay. investors. But our big investors that are corporates, that are families, that have money, they'll recycle 100%. And they'll double down 
Maybe they were a 1 million in the fund. They put 10 million because they're happy to turn 10 million into 30 million or 40 million or just 20 million. That's good for them. Bad for the fund, bad for my performance. But I, I think you can make different LPs happy with their different circumstances. Uh, just a question regarding for the Oksana question, how can uh, reduce the multiple? I, as I told you, I'm doing the business valuation for the startup behalf of individual investor here based on Dubai. And I used to do uh, the discounted, build the financial model from scratch, income statements, balance sheet, discounted cash flow. And I did, I used to go to the pitch book and capital IQ to see what's happening I make the comparable sheet based on the geographic, based on the industry, the sectors, the growth rate, everything. I'm, I'm, I'm right for, for this one, for this approach, or there is something wrong to, to choose how much the, the, the multiple. I Do think, you have any recommendation? Yeah, or, I think or, what was what missing. I'm doing this correct, yeah. What was missing from what I understood you explaining mm -hmm. was what I've been primarily talking about today, which mm -hmm. is, what will the exit look like? What's the valuation I'm coming in at today? And how much funding are they gonna raise? At what kind of valuation in terms? And how will that change what I get from this exit, considering it's not being sold tomorrow with no additional funding? So I'm pretty sure there's gonna be no more funding for Super Coffee. So we look at that one as saying, how much is it going to get sold for? And it's a direct multiple of this valuation. And we're looking at the share price and the share price. What's the, what's the multiple, you know? Mm. That for most companies, you expect that the founders and the existing investors and board of directors will accept more funding at stupid valuations. Like Facebook never really needed money it was just people willing to invest at ever increasing valuations. So they said, sure, I'll take it. And that has a big impact on, er on early investors. So the one that's missing is what do you think the exit can look like and what's going to change after this financing and then? If nothing changes and it's a super coffee that's going direct to an exit, you know, you've got mm -hmm. your idea of what the multiple is on your fund investment, not multiple of their revenue. And does that satisfy your strategy as a fund? Like, look, if you and I raised a $1 billion fund mm. and we deployed that money and we made a 2X return and you and I are 50-50 going to divide the 20% of carry, that is $100 million for you and $100 million for me. That sounds pretty good, yeah? If you and I have a $50 million fund and we have a lot of employees and expenses, a 2X return, we should be taken out back into the desert and shot and killed. That's bad. Yes. You know. Yeah, please. Um, one, more, one more point, if you could clarify um, or maybe share your experience in terms of when you, when you mentioned about um, when the second round or the exits uh, companies or the acquirers, in the case of m &A, try to give as much as possible to the founders and the management uh, of the company, whereas they try to minimize what they give to the early investors. So what is your strategy and, and uh, your recommendations, please? I think the most truthful answer to that and, and to be a good actor in the ecosystem, in in an evolved ecosystem where the founders and early investors have a lot of choice of who to do business with. The real answer is diversification. That um, because you're diversified, you can watch this horrible situation unfold where you, the investor, are getting, you know, they're moving money out of your bank, your pocket into someone else's pocket. And you basically watch it go down and you can say to people, look, I see what you're doing. And this is a small community. And I have a lot of friends, you know, like when, when Yuri had me as the public speaker at his 
you know, the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco, every other person that walked in that room was giving me a big hug. So I may not have a big fund, but I've got a lot of friends. If someone really screws us over, I'll, I'll, I'll tell people if they ever ask me, we would never fund this person ever again because mm. I got screwed the last time. Like the last time I parked my car, it got totally smashed up. I'm not going to park my car there again as a joke, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of all you can do really. I've seen people, I, I had drinks with an entrepreneur a few days ago who told me a story where there was like Rupert Murdoch here and Steve Jobs there. And then like when this acquisition was happening, his investors were trying to cut him out of a deal and then failed. And so he's got a story about his VCs. He's a founder trying to somehow screw him over at the time of exit to optimize for their own take on that deal. And they ended up losing their attempt of this little putsch coup d'etat. Uh, and he's still telling bad stories about those people. Hmm. I think um, you can, I think you can, I think good karma is a winning strategy that like, if you're really good to the founder and say, you know what, dude, I'm diversified. I made money before I became a VC. I'm making money now. People will fund our next fund. We'll get into good deals. If this goes the way you're talking about, I'll be okay, but you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't screw people if we can all win. If we can all win, let's all win mm. and play together Why again. Why not? You know, Raul, Raul sold his last company for $15 million to LinkedIn. His company is valued at $825 million right now. And in my mind, it could sell to Microsoft for 2 billion today and it'll sell for five or 10 billion. He doesn't need to screw anybody. And if he screwed people on the LinkedIn deal, he wouldn't be where he is today. So I think the best thing you can do is help the other people like your portfolio company. Mm -hmm. So they like you and, and they understand this is a small world. You can go to China and think, oh, I can behave really badly and be a serial rapist in China and they'll never hear about this. And the other province of China they actually will. Amazing. I, that. You, I was once walking down the street in New York City in my early 20s with my arm around a girl that was not my girlfriend. Guess who we saw? My girlfriend. I got caught in that city right there. <laughs> um, a little bit related to, to the same question, but um, so there is a belief uh, that when VC steps into the deal. They don't like like uh, the early investors to be having shares more than a certain amount, like 10% or 20%. Uh, is there such a such a number, and that founders should have as minimal as 50%? Is there yeah. any any benchmarks there? Yeah. So the topic you're raising is a timeless Shakespearean topic of how do you raise early stage funding where you make your financing attractive to early stage investors and balance it where you don't sell so much equity that when new investors come, they see too much dead weight in the cap table that, that, that um, it doesn't look like a fit with what like they do. Это, uh, подходит друг к другу. Илья, thank you so much. We are taking a break from the interpretation. Thank you okay. so much. Yeah. I'll speak I'll speak a little slower. Yeah. So so the when, when deciding what percentage of my company should I sell as a founder to early stage investors they normally are worried mostly about dilution. What percentage will I own at the time of the IPO or M&A? They should not think so much about this. They're already thinking so much about dilution. They should try to become more of an elevated Buddha and think about other things to survive and get to the exit, okay? So if they raise money at too high a valuation, it'll be, and they don't make good progress with revenue, building a product, talking to customers, growing the real value of the business, the next financing round 
after they spend that money could be a down round or impossible. So it's dangerous to raise too much money just because some oligarch is throwing the cash at you. So you wanna be careful to not raise too much money, to not make the kind of progress you need to raise the next round. You wanna make sure you don't raise money at too high a valuation, that the next round isn't an easy walk in the park to do an up round. Now, at the same time, you might be trying to make your early stage round attractive to early stage investors. And the result is that you sold maybe 50% of the company. And now you go to professional series A VCs and you say, look, I'm okay with owning 50% of the company now, getting diluted with another 20, 30% a few times because the pizza pie gets bigger. My slice is smaller, but my little slice is worth a lot of money. I'm happy. The problem is the new VC, and I think this is what you are alluding to, the new VC may arrive and say, we want to take 20 to 33% of the, of the ownership now, and we want to invest again at least once or twice at a bigger valuation, so we're going to buy more, and then we want to introduce you to other VCs that invest the $100 million checks and the $200 million checks. And you already sold too much of the business that you can only go through one or two or three more funding rounds. Most companies in Silicon Valley or New York or London will go through maybe nine or 10 official funding rounds before getting to an exit. And if you sold too much early, you're in trouble. So magic number, I think if you're below 33% equity in the hands of outside investors going into a Series A, you're pretty healthy. The, the, the more equity you have for fin financing and also to retain and attract talent to work at the company is part of it. Sometimes the VC says, I want to invest and I have a lot of people we can hire around the world to work at your company. And if you've sold all the shares, there's not a lot left. And, and there's only so much time to talk right now, so I'll stop, but rejigging, readjusting the ESOP, the employee stock option pool is a big way early investors get hurt. And, and founders that leave the company get hurt. That sometimes they sell so much to investors early and along the journey that the employee stock option pool needs to be increased. And, and there's a new investor saying, I want to invest 50 million, 10 million, whatever number. There's not enough ownership in the stock option pool. And I don't care about Andrew and Yuri who are the first investors in the company. They don't, they don't love us one bit. And so they rejig the ESOP and it screws early guys like us. How do you protect yourself from these uh, big investors in the later rounds? Well, uh, we spend time talking to founders about different scenarios of how things can unfold. And we talk to our portfolio companies about what they can expect to hear from those later investors. You know, in like the cartoon of the movie where there's a devil on this shoulder saying, go ahead and do it. And there's an angel saying, don't do that. You'll go to hell. I think of the founder is going to have like the devil screaming at him, just take it, do it. And it's my <laughs> job to say, one day you're going to have someone telling you, oh, we need to raise, our competitors are raising a lot of money. We need to raise a much bigger financing round. And now you're going to be stuck having to pay $100 million back first, or maybe they have a 2x liquidation preference. You've got to pay $200 million back to these idiots who are helping not at all. 
before you as common shareholder founder make anything. Yeah. Why don't we just raise a small round now and double the valuation between now and December because you can hire more salespeople, hire more engineers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've got, it's back to the five forces. Everyone has a conflicting view of the same company in the same contemplated next financing round or M&A event or secondary or whatever. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Because uh, we, we got screwed by uh, late stage investors a couple of times. And one of these times we were together in that deal <laughs> with, uh, you know, which company. Yeah. Yeah, his first name starts with J, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, we should let uh, Andrew go. Yeah. Uh, just uh, quick question, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Quick question. Quick question, Andrew. Um, what is the average uh, timeline that you look at from the first uh, coming across with the idea or the pitch, and by the by the time you write the check? And okay. second question. Mm-hmm. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. All right, so let's do them one at a time. So, what's the speed with our firm from meeting the company for the first time to wiring funds? I mean, the truthful answer is that we were, we're not new, we're old. We've been in the industry since the mid 1990s and we know a lot of people. So things don't usually jump up and surprise us. And I generally don't think anything ended well where someone's opening line is, this really great deal has a short fuse. It's like a stick of dynamite with the fuse and it goes like, this deal has got a really short fuse, but oh, it's really good. I'm like, you know, I like the allegories, I, you know. I can afford, I can afford to not make that investment, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I like it more that like Yuri shows me something and tells me why he likes it. And maybe he invests in it. And now he knows everything that's happening there. And then he knows how our network can be helpful. So it's not about our USD check doesn't bounce. So it's not about our money is good or the only good thing about this guy is he's not in Al Qaeda, you know, that they want me in the deal. They want our team in the deal. So we usually have a period of time that we get to know people or we knew them before. Um, Mm -hmm. But we're a small investment committee. We can make a decision. You know, we can make a decision within a day if we have to. And I keep my little you know, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic dongle with me so I can wire money if I have to. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever I'm sleeping that night, I have the ability to wire money, usually. I'm not from Holland. I don't take Mm nine-week vacations in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, but, but I would say typical is nothing really, it's very rare that we invest in something that takes us by surprise. I would say the closest thing is going to a demo day. And, you know, we're not a mentor in every, you know, one of those things. So I'm not optimizing of investing in week, you know, week six of a 12 week program and arbing between now and demo day. So we'll pay up for the demo day price usually or not do it or, 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 or We don't like it now, but we'll wait for the next one. And we missed it when we would have liked it. Um, Those might move quickly. So something could happen in a week. Mm -hmm. If someone wants less than a week, I probably, it's not my style of fear of missing out FOMA nonsense. What Mm -hmm. was your second question? The second question is you you invited, as part of your presentation, you invited the uh, other starting investors to, to join you on a deal, deal to deal, deal by deal basis, or rather as a more on a constant basis as, a, as an LP. Do you yourself follow other investors or funds? Yeah, so uh, so we work with other investors in a couple of ways. One is there are VCs from many countries around the world that mm-hmm. have personal money in our VC fund. So it's not their fund, it's their personal savings and they become LPs and we, We do barbecue parties, like where we invite only the LPs in the fund and the portfolio companies so everyone can mix. And so, you know, meeting a VC from Singapore, Japan, even Brazil, 
is interesting for our portfolio companies. And it gives a little bit of our identity of who are we? We're not just gringos, you know, we're very global, you know, with our name, right? And, and so there's that level of, and when we do an SPV, they get first, you know, most favored nation status. We show it to our LPs first, and only wow. if they do not take everything in the SPV, which could be a secondary, it could be, you know, a primary, wow. then we're ready to put it on angel list and let the unwashed masses that are there to participate and invest. And there are VCs, there are venture capitalists that are doing that, um, that, that are investing. And there's some people that refuse to use AngelList. They have a problem with Naval or something. And so we do our own self-managed SPVs. And for any check above a certain amount, we'll just do it with our own SPV. So that's the second way we work it. And the third way is um, we just share deal flow. Like I'm not investing in their fund. They're not investing in my fund. Um, as of today, I'm not an LP in any other funds by putting in cash, but I have introduced um, our LPs to VCs that are friends of mine. And when my, when my LP invests in their fund, instead of paying me a finder's fee, I put the finder's fee into the fund as an LP. So I become, that way I pay no tax today and um, I hopefully get capital gains tax or as a US tax pay, t- taxpayer, QSBS, qualified small business stock. So if they hold it for five years in a day and the valuation plus the round was under 50 million, I pay zero mm-hmm. tax, which is great for mm-hmm. an American. So, so, and then I'm kind of more excited about sending my deal flow to that fund because I've got, I'm an LP in it through that. And I only do that if they reciprocate and introduce me to some LPs for my fund. Mm. And it's a little bit like a hostage, hostage exchange on a bridge, even though they're <laughs> hugging you. Oh yeah, dude, I'll do this. His partner's like, are you crazy? You're gonna introduce our best old lady oil person from Houston to Andrew Romans. And, and then all of a sudden he's not doing it. I'm like, you know, you promise to reciprocate. You're not reciprocating. I'll never introduce you to another LP. And you're not my most favored VC to share deal flow. So people have bad personalities, good personalities. It gets complicated, but that's about it. I, I generally do not invest in, if I invest my management fee into my fund, I pay no ordinary income tax. And we typically are only capital gains, if not QSBS. So just the tax is amazing. And my fund is getting a 12X cash on cash return. So it's, and I'm now paying it back sooner. So I'm, I'm highly motivated to not invest in anyone else's fund compared to the tax. And then people want to see a GP commitment. The general partner is putting his own money in. And mm-hmm. I'm not Peter Thiel, Mark Andreessen, or Joe Lonsdale. So it's not like I just had 50 billion lying around, you know. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. We enjoyed this. Thank Pleasure. you. Cool. Thank right. you. Alan. Let's uh, let's let you go uh, and enjoy your day you. in Austin, right? In Austin, yeah. right? Yeah, we we we've made the big migration. This is the this is the best part of San Francisco with the best talent and coolest VCs right now. So um, I'll put a link to my slides on yeah, the Telegram. Telegram. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much, and happy to meet anyone in the real world or offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank, you, very Thank much. you very much. Thank you. Hey. Okay. Oof. We are the last uh, man standing. Uh, <laughs> amazing stuff. Huh? Amazing session. Amazing. It is. It is. It it is. is.